assume that most people do this already. In fact, if I go into organizations that don't officially do uh, Agile, okay, the first thing I ask the teams is, who knows what Scrum is? Who knows what Agile is? Most of them do, and we still want to get some ideas about consistency. But Agile is the new black. Everybody has it. Okay. Um, there is a problem, though, a nagging problem, which is not nagging to put the toilet seat down. Uh, the problem has to do with big organizations and complex problems. Um, and the way that most people like to talk about it is to not talk about it. Okay? They say, no, 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 it's easy. All you have to do for scrum teams to coordinate together is have a scrum of scrums. And to be honest with you, I don't think that solves a lot. Okay, uh, if you're having problems as an organization working together, then I don't see why having a couple of uh, people get together a couple of times a week and ask three magic questions of the teams, what have the teams done, uh, you know, what are they doing right now, and what problems do they have? I don't think that solves a lot by itself. Okay, um, but I do want to hold a scope issue out. This is not a presentation talking about how to organize scrum teams together to put products out on the market. Okay, I happen to subscribe to a particular form of that from uh, Craig Marman, okay, with uh, feature teams, and I, I do believe in that. What we're going to be talking about is how to plan between teams to work collaboratively on different products within the organization. And I'm going to start recognizing some things in that organization which many people will call like core competencies. Okay, so let's talk about this distinction that I like to make between products and platforms. And I'm going to use as an example a now dated uh, example, uh, picture of Apple products. Right? <coughs> Apple makes a lot of hardware. They make a lot of money doing it. Okay, and the way that they uh, differentiate their product lines is do you hold it with one hand? Do you hold it with two hands? Or do you put it on a table? All right. And um, they want you to be able to do lots of different things, um, but be able to do the same stuff on all of their different product lines. Now, to do that, they have, they recognize some certain platforms. Okay, and one of them is like an iCloud. Right? iCloud. Um, allows you to have the same sort of content wherever you are. Okay, that's the way it's advertised. That's the way Apple wants people to understand it. Okay, they're not the only ones, of course. You know, Microsoft has the same sort of thing. But it's, an, uh, it's something underneath the products that are actually sold to you. Now, iCloud happens to be very visible. It's in your face all the time. There are other companies that are quite not so visible. And I was working with a major U.S. telecom, uh, that would be <coughs> AT&T, um, that uh, we were working on a product, and all of a sudden we started to see that the things that they wanted to work on, on the bottom, they were doing things like changing the TCP IP stack to actually implement plan uh, product features. And they needed to do this on a whole bunch of different products that we were trying to put together. And uh, it wasn't the first time that I saw it, it was the first time I really wanted to delve into it. Um, they also um, sold that platform. They actually had you know, something like an SDK. They marketed it to other companies as well as marketed it sort of with you know, cost sharing inside the organization to the product teams. So it was kind of a pain in the process uh, to transform that organization. They were so used to doing things the way that they were, which was very waterfallish, a lot of planning up front, to change that around to something a lot more agile. Okay? Um, so the point I want to make is that if you're developing features that will transcend any one product delivery, that you have lots of different products that are out there, that kind of planning and coordination doesn't happen in the typical simple agile scrum sort of adoptions, especially when you start talking about things like, oh, it's easy to scrum the scrums. Um, I want to make a clear distinction. Product concerns talk about the functional and non-functional stuff that has to happen for people like product owners 
to be able to have value to, their, to the customers that they sell products to. Right? But larger organizations that are trying to scale, they need to understand a different thing, that platform. And that platform addresses concerns that cross-cut among many different products. Right? And we need consistency within them. Right? Those are the sort of things that are platform concerns. How many people in, in the audience work in companies that have things like platforms within them? In other words, kind of components that get used in a bunch of different products. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's really funny how even um, in enterprises with just IT sorts of things, we start to see some of that come out. Uh, we used to call them silos, right? Um, and silos came about because of the understanding of um, economy of scale, right? That sort of thinking, that manufacturing thinking, said we can do this in a predictive sort of process, right? But that doesn't really work in the space that software development finds itself, right? We're not going to go into that. That's pretty introductory stuff. However, I do believe that because of architectural concerns, that is those decisions which are very difficult and costly to go back and refactor, um, the art of looking at architectural concerns, there is some, there's something in there for centralized design, right? Architecture is going to require that good architecture that requires less refactoring later. If it's expensive, um, there's something that we have to deal with. And good architecture doesn't happen with committees. Good architecture doesn't happen to just grow out of nothingness. You need sort of like the best and the brightest usually to make that occur. Right? So we need a way to make that nice small group uh, accountable for the architecture. And at the same time, we need a way to make them effective within the organization to get that work out. And that's really what we're all here about today. Two other small concepts that I want to consider along the way. And that is the difference between research and development. It's really odd to me. Okay, and I don't know if the same language transcends our, our continents, but I, I talk to people and they say, oh, we have an R and D team. And I say, well, what's the difference between the R and the D? And they say, no, 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 there's no difference. <laughs> right? Research gives us ideas that enable new products to be formed from them. Right? Development is the thing that hones that idea and makes it into something marketable. Right? Research usually has a different cadence. Um, I was working with a GPS company. We had a ton of problems because these guys were putting together printed circuit boards to try to you know, get past the simulation and emulation. They were actually not having to test on the real metal. Right? And the cadence of building printed circuit boards is not the same as putting together a couple of classes, compiling it, and running all the automated tests. It takes a longer time. Um, and the problem is, you know, you could go to development people and say, I got these three things over here I need you to work on for the next two weeks. Can you commit to that? And you say, yes. But then you go back to the hardware people and say, well, you've got some issues with ground loops. And uh, how are you going to take care of that? And they say, in two weeks, I don't think we can do that and give you new engineering samples. So we do have to recognize that the difference between research and development, it's, it's real. There's another issue that we have to recognize. And that has to do with the type of work that our teams or research teams versus D, development teams, work in. So this is probably a familiar diagram to you, the Stacy matrix. Right, which measures the, uh, the way that we understand the problem versus the way that we understand the solution. Right? And in Stacy, things that are very far from being understood, either in what the problem is or what the solution are, are chaotic. Things that we know all about it, they're simple. Most of development for software is in this complicated to complex space. And within that, most of the research stuff will fall more on the complex side, and most of the development stuff will be somewhere closer to complicated, right? because it becomes less of a research problem, more of an engineering problem. Finally, as far as 
the business is concerned, they could care less about this stuff. Right? Most businesses are very concerned about what the products are, finding the right market for them, you know, making sure that they hit the right kind of points in terms of pricing and timing and whatnot. Uh, whether we do agile, or I should say, whether we do scrum by the book, they couldn't care less. Right? And nor should they. So, that's kind of the problem. Now I'm going to talk about six ways that I've encountered that people try to solve the problem, but I need to be able to score them so I can say from bad to good. And I'll have one exception, you can see. Um, this diagram is called um, Seinfeld, a, a Sinnenfin diagram. I don't know why Steinfeld kind of came out of that. Uh, uh, which talks about the, the problem in a different way, right? If we have simple sorts of problems to solve, basically just use a nice checklist. If we have more complicated problems, the checklist either is too long or really can't be put together. But we will have a number of best practices that we can you know, uh, enunciate and follow. Complex problems, on the other hand, are only solved when we start looking at uh, the values and principles behind the sorts of things that we do. Right? And truly chaotic problems, uh, you really can't make much of a plan to solve them. Right, the, the, in, in a complex, oh, I'm sorry, in a chaotic space, it's really a matter of scientific experiment and trying a whole lot of things very quickly. That's how you solve a chaotic problem. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is grade my solutions based on lean principles, and I'll first talk very briefly about the seven deadly ways. So I want to get on to the solutions and give some time to talk about them. Right. Um, comes from Tahishi Ono. Um, he described it in the Toyota production system. Now this was taken by the Pachendix back in 2003. They had a very famous book that I'll bet everybody in here has read called Lean Software Development and Agile Toolkit. Right. Um, I'm going to spin through these. When I do, and as I talk about the solutions, I'm going to use the acronym Tim Wood. Okay, because it will help organize things. So each of the letters follow in the same order, so we don't get confused. Okay. Um, the first waste is transportation, and it has to do with moving things, right? In you know, in a, a world of goods and services, when you start seeing shipping crates, you start seeing places to store stuff. You know that there's transportation waste that are occurring underneath it. In software, we see that kind of stuff, and we have handoffs. Right? We complete one document, put it away, we notify somebody, and then we move on to something else. Right? Those handoffs will occur with the development process. We just talked about analysis, we talked about design, coding, <coughs> testing, each of those things. And many times, we reflect that process in the silos that we put together, thinking, ah, they'll know how to do it best, so we'll leave it up to those silos to handle that, which is where you get Things like QA groups for okay, all that, transportation waste. Inventory waste is kind of related, related because the stuff that's work in process um, that, we're, that we're dealing with doesn't have any value yet. There's, there's a lot of costs associated with inventory, but until we translate that into something that the customer needs, it's pure waste. Right? And Many, many times we don't see inventory waste because we see it as the way we work, it's the way we do our business around right here. We got to challenge that kind of stuff. Those are the sorts of things that occur, you know, with uh, documents or uh, having classes for code that we don't need within our current scope, right? Um, another great inventory waste, very easy to measure. You can do this on Monday morning. Go back to your repository and see how many branches you have. Okay, because each time you're branching your code, you're committing another inventory <coughs> waste, which will come up when you try to put them together in conflict merger. Right? Inventory kind of waste. Uh, motion waste is a little bit different than the transportation waste because instead of damaging the goods that we're working on, we're damaging the things that are moving them around. Right? <laughs> Um, and uh, it's a little bit more difficult. It doesn't, it doesn't present itself well. It's not that in software we're damaging the machines. We're actually damaging 
damaging are the people that are doing the software development. And we damage them by task switching. So you have a group that has to move from one thing to another, and they can't focus on getting one thing done, there's going to be motion waste inside that process. Waiting waste is something I'm sure everybody knows about, right? Uh, waiting waste, uh, it's, it's amazing when you look at it, you know, uh, Womack once described uh, a waiting waste that Coca-Cola was having. They looked at the cycle time between mining bauxite for aluminum and producing coke in cans that, that people would consume. And if I recall correctly, somewhere around 92% of the time was being spent in inventory and waiting for the next processing step. Right, 92% waste on waiting. Um, and the companies that can go and get rid of that waste will uh, benefit a lot, right? Uh, in any case, uh, we commit um, uh, waiting waste all the time. Uh, again, it has to usually do with silo. Overprocessing as a waste that occurs when we use things that are more expensive than we need to. So, for example, if we were going to use, uh, we're going to build a car, and the car needs a spark plug, right? Uh, using a spark plug that's only going to last for 100,000 miles, let's say 250,000 kilometers, right, um, is fine. That's going to be the average life of the car. Using a spark plug that's 10 times more costly but can last twice as long, yeah, it's a better spark plug, but who cares, right? We do that kind of stuff in software development. Okay, we do it all the time. Okay, we sometimes think, oh, a great UML 2.0 diagram is so much better because look, it conforms the standard, right? When all we really need is a nice picture on the board that we can talk to, take a photograph of it, send it on to the next point, all right? Um, or, uh, this is actually very funny, um, a group that was trying to use every one of the gang of, um, of four design patterns because they thought that they had achieved Nirvana by uh, using every one of them, right? Overprocessing. Overproduction um, is related um, to batching, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, right? Um, and will slow us down. Um, overproduction will result in things like inventory waste, and of course, motion waste, and, and a lot. Um, so many people consider it overproduction waste, which is building more stuff than you need, so you have to inventory. Um, as, a, as a bad thing. A great example of that um, occurs when you look at the uh, Pareto effect, 80-20 rule, right? And uh, Josh had a picture up there, it was actually from the standards group that showed that, right? Where we only produce 20% of the features that are actually uh, used all the time or frequently, and 80% of the features that aren't used really often, <laughs> tempered with the fact that in a in a world where you're competing with a competitor that has those other features, you're probably going to have to achieve feature parity. That's another story. <laughs> Defect waste um, is uh, a, a really horrible waste, right? Because large defects that occur that we deal with right away usually are not fatal, usually aren't all that damaging. They may become, again, something of a learning experience for us. Whereas even a small latent defect that we don't find out until like the, the night before a release is supposed to happen, you know, might cause uh, an evening or a night of uh, pizza and Mountain Dew. We have Mountain Dew out here. Coke. Uh, well into the evening. Uh, Mountain Dew in the United States is known as the most highly caffeinated beverage. So it's the choice, you know, the drink of choice for many people, uh, developers. All right, seven deadly ways. I want to talk briefly, uh, and I'll bet that, and I'll have a show of hands. Uh, who knows of uh, James Womack and um, his Lean Thinking book and the exercise that he did with his daughters? Oh, all right, I'm gonna get this story. I'll do it, I'll do it quickly, because I want to get on. All right, we've got to talk about batches, right? Large batches are a bad thing, right? Uh, but the problem with large batches is that at a very early age, we get convinced that we can be very efficient by doing things in silos. Okay, and it goes back to assembly lines and trying to transfer that to other activities that we do. So, in 1996, uh, 
James Wilmette. Oh, the resolution is a little bit weird here. So you're seeing the stuff on the bottom. Disregard. Uh, 1996 book, Me Thinking, Womack talks about uh, the story he gives about his daughters. Now, James Womack was a, a researcher at MIT um, on lean topics, and his daughters were six and nine. Back in those days, people communicated with like newsletters. They actually printed them, put them into envelopes, and mailed them out like once a month. Um, he wanted to be with his daughters. So he said, hey, listen, guys, I got this stuff to do, um, but I got to take these flyers today and fold them and stick them into envelopes and mail them out. You guys want to help? And they said, sure, Daddy. Um, so he said, all right, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each flyer, we're going to fold it, we're going to put it on an envelope, we're going to put um, the address on it, we're going to put a stamp on it, and then we're going to put in the pile and says, we're done. And they said, Daddy, that's, that's done. I mean, we should really have them where we fold all the envelopes first, and then we put them all into the into the oh, I'm sorry, fold all the flyers first, then stuff them into the envelopes, and then we'll put all the addresses on, we'll put the stamps on. Classic assembly line. And James, of course, said, hmm, I don't think you're gonna do so well. Let's have a race. And they said, okay. So they divided up the stuff. The daughters were doing it in that very efficient assembly line. And James, of course, was doing a one envelope and flyer at a time. Who do you think won? Well, yeah, James is the, uh, the safe choice. I mean, what do you expect from an MIT research director, right? Um, but we couldn't understand why. And the daughters, especially, like, how do you do that? That's magic, right? But when you look at the problem, you realize all of the waste that goes into putting stuff in nice, neat stacks and moving them from one stack to the next. Or defect waste, right? How many times have you folded like a, a, a letter or a flyer, put it in the envelope and find out, oh, it didn't fold it right, it doesn't fit. Right, so if you fold on 100 flyers, now you gotta go fix 100 different things. Right, so uh, the idea here is that work in process with is very important. Batch sizes are very important. Um, and what James was doing is what you call single stream flow. You do one thing, focus on it, then move on. Right? That's one of the principles that comes out when you do things like Scrum or in some Kanban situation. Allow us to focus, not task switch, right? not commit so many lead waste. Um, and the point of all of this is that as an organization, we don't need efficient silos. What we need are effective organizations. Okay, and um, uh, again, when we start looking at the ways, we'll figure this out. So let's go in and talk about ways that we can go about doing uh, this problem, scale up, fixing it. I'm not going to dwell on this. But the first way that many organizations who start doing things with Scrum and then throwing up their hands is to say, oh my god, I can't do this. Let's go back to Waterfall. Because like, we're too big and complex. Scrum and Agile, they don't scale. You know, well, uh, we know Waterfall, we're good at it. Or we feel much safer when we use some of the templates from things like Rock or Prince. Okay, and that's what you hear. What happens when you do that is you start taking all of the silos, people, right, and then matrixing them. Okay, you work 20% on, on this project, you work 20% on it, you're 10. So the team, if you will, is matrixed out of the functional areas, and then the projects go across them, which means that everyone has at least two managers. Um, there's lots of status reporting going on, lots of meetings that occur. Right? And the silos are managed to be efficient, but the organization can't be very effective. Even if, even if they do what they say, right? even if we do uh, waterfall well, right? we can find out that we can be on time, on budget, on feature, we'd still fail. Right? And that's the danger, the biggest danger in this stuff. Uh, to go back, I'm not going to go through each of these because I think you already know them, but you're going to see the grades that come up, right? Here's Tim, Wood, and Batching. If it's got a red letter, that means bad. 
So I, I would consider waterfall to be the worst possible way of dealing with the scale. All right, it's probably the way that we started at the organization. Why would we go back to it? Now, the sort of ways that are kind of related, right? The first one I'll call, let's do scrub everywhere, but we'll keep our um, platform <coughs> silos, right? Um, and most of it comes out of like, oh, if we could fix those product delivery teams, that's going to fix the problem, right? But our core components, Man, those are really important. We're going to keep doing them in a waterfall kind of way. What happens when you take the organization is you'll find the one thing, hopefully one thing, that you're going to keep in a silo. In this case, I'm thinking of like um, something where there's a lot of web dev going on and then a big data component on the back end. Right? You're going to get these other teams into real scrum teams. And then you're going to have an endless number of meetings talking about the dependencies between the backend stuff on big data and every one of the stories that the other teams are going to be working on, all the other features. Right? And what we're going to come up with, basically, is a waterfall plan that says when we're going to be doing development for each of the teams. Right? So it's really waterfall planning with some scrub execution. And somehow that's supposed to work. Right? Well, it doesn't. Right? Uh, because the scrub teams no longer can always be ready to ship. Right? The planning that went on at first, where we planned out all the dependencies, um, any assumption that goes wrong, like an estimation, the whole plan fails. Right? Um, and the other problem with it, what I find, is that the silos that we keep are usually the most difficult things to work with. So the product teams are left hopeless about how to integrate this stuff with their product. They don't understand the platform. Right? It's all with the platform people, but those guys are still too busy. So when I look at the results of this kind of stuff, with batching, really didn't move the needle. Right? Everything is all pre-planned and pre-dependencies. <laughs> Transportation still uses so many documents Right? And the uh, you know, platform team usually wants it that way. Right? If changes are needed, um, you know, you've got to make some you know, Herculean uh, sorts of efforts to try to change what's going on right now in the platform team's project plan. Inventory waste hasn't gone away. Right? Because we're not really going to get rid of any of those dependencies until the very end. Um, now, motion-wise, since we have scrum teams, some product owners may be able to figure out stuff to do that doesn't have dependencies. So we made a little progress with that. It's yellow, all right, you can do better. All right, waiting wise, nothing's changed. Okay, until we get end-to-end -end integration, including all of those platform concerns, product owners can't sign off, they have to see it work. Over-processing has gotten slightly better. Right, because now we're focusing delivery teams. We're not having the matrix and task switch between many different kind of projects at once. So that's going to get a little bit better. Um, you know, over production, again, we're going to assume that once people are starting to use Agile and Scrum, they're going to conform to things like Yagni, right, ain't going to need it. So uh, they'll be able to focus better and do just the kind of stuff that we need. Notice that that may have some architectural issues, which we'll talk about. And defect-wise, since we can't do integration until the end, it's still just as bad as the waterfall. Now, I find a really interesting spin on that with things for component silos and guest stars. How many people in here are used to guest stars? Uh, all right, so uh, you go to a place and you find out that they'd like to staff real product delivery teams, let's say, doing Scrum, but they say, uh, we can't do that, right? So instead, uh, you'll have lots of uh, planning meetings, and you'll start hearing comments like, and these are actual quotes, uh, we'll be ready for integration at the end, just like we said, okay, it sounds very waterfallish. you know, uh, hey, you guys are gonna have to figure it out, we don't have any time, we're fully booked for all the time that's out here. So we had to figure it out, they're gonna have to figure Right? Or, my favorite, yeah, we could have done it this way or that way, whatever, um, but you know, we've already made all those design decisions, so you're going to have to 
take it the way that we do it. What it looks like, okay, is very similar to the other diagram, except now there are some people that we give like, I guess, pink stars to, and we say, you're a guest star. You go to Scrum Team One's planning meetings. Maybe even get them to go to the daily scrums. Right? You're number two, you're number three, and so on and so forth. Um, giving them that, that title of guest star is kind of supposed to make them feel better, right? Because they don't have to sit with the platform teams and just do the work. Uh, and the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, when you ask people, these guest stars, how's the work coming, they, their reply is usually, oh, it's fine. We're doing good. Um, or if they're asked questions, it's like, well, I don't really know. But uh, don't worry, it's going according to spec, right? So they never really get to discuss the things that the Scrum teams actually need, which is like, what's the architecture really look like? How does this integration occur, right? Um, so we still have a problem that we get great architectures, but they solve different problems. And we have problems with integration at the end, which is massive rework followed by death marches. Not a good thing. In terms of results, batching has it fixed, right? We're still doing integration at the end. Transportation gets a little bit better because they're, because it's verbal, of, you know, questions that are going on, uh, there's not as many documents out there. Inventory doesn't get different. Motion is still a little bit better because, again, the product owner can make things flow. Waiting doesn't get better just because we call them guest stars. This is still a silo platforms, over processing, over production and defects, they all get a tad better. Guest stars. We could say scrub for everybody, right? And what that sort of looks like is we take the platform team and disband them. And we put a couple of people on each of the scrum teams. We say, there you go, you're t-shirted, you know, or t-shaped rather, and uh, go forth and be married. Um, some of the platform people actually hate that, right? Because they consider the product people like a lower you know, form of life. Um, so, you know, it, it can be a an issue. Um, the problem, or the real problem, is architecture. Because the architectural concerns now are on each of the scrum teams to figure it out and somehow work this together. Um, so that's the, the root cause of this, is that we still have people that are out there, um, and somehow we haven't been able to engage our best and brightest into this kind of stuff that we need, put the platforms together that enable our product development. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in terms of results, because we're doing Scrum, some of the things get better. Batching improves, but doesn't go away, right? And that's because we're still going to have to take these steps in architecture that are costly. We have to bring them together for all the scrum teams. We're getting rid of a lot of the transportation waste. Again, it doesn't get completely better. Um, but, you know, uh, we have the danger of these fragile architectural solutions. Inventory waste, take hey, it goes away. Right? Uh, to the extent that we don't have to create documents to take and move between silos, it, it's better. Motion is better because of that. Waiting and over-processing are still just a little bit better. Um, what we're doing is we're replacing waiting on platform teams, though, with waiting on product teams. All right, those dependencies haven't gone away. Um, Overproduction is still better. I want to move away from this, though. Talk about these two solutions. Okay, one of them has to do with forming a different company, right? We may find ourselves with a, a silo saying, hey, we're the guys that have the primary intellectual property of this company. It fuels the organization. Um, and until and unless we get enough staff to work with so that we can put our talent on all the teams, we need to stay together, right? Or you have an organization that actually has a product and a platform. It's a platform that is used on internal products, and it's a platform that they sell to actual customers outside, okay? And you know, it makes a lot of sense. What happens with this is you'll organize company B, um, which
which is going to be the platform team. Uh, and we're going to have several teams out there. Whether or not they work with Scrum or Agile doesn't really matter, because your product teams are working completely independently. What we're doing is focusing on the platform concern, right? And um, this is going to, oh, and actually another reason for this, and a very important reason, is that sometimes uh, there are regulatory reasons for doing this. Uh, Microsoft is a great example of a company that was under regulatory pressure that they had to do this. Um, and I see this also happening for some of these big companies that are out there. In fact, the client I'm working with right now has this problem. Um, in terms of what can go wrong, companies that are successful will be able to organize their backlogs and treat most of the customers that they need to treat well, do the jobs for them, right? Um, but we still have problems in terms of uh, that disassociation of purpose. We have platform people, we have product people, and they're, they're really not coming together enough. Uh, and, you know, again, the, the job of, the job that we're trying to uh, look at is optimizing the organization, not just trying to optimize our platform people. That's where we really go wrong. So if you look, and because of time, I'm not going to go into each of these. The, if I analyze this from lean, I don't see great results. However, I believe that it's better than a lot of the stuff you saw in the first three or four solutions, right? Because you actually get stuff done. The biggest problem with this, just to summarize it, is that once you have a different company, your cycle time, the, the smallest amount of time necessary to see a change in like a a minimal marketable feature, a minimum viable product, may go from like a sprint's worth, not just to a release's worth, which is what you would hope to achieve with like the waterfall, but actually can become two releases worth. Because the new company has to take this in, mix it with all the other things that they're planning on the next release. So your cycle times may go nuts when you do this. But it's a great solution to certain problems. The way that I like to see things done is what I call Scrum Everywhere and Core Component Kanban Teams. Okay, and it's a radical departure. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this slide. What we actually do is take our platform, divide it in half. We're gonna recognize the platform R team, research team, which is always gonna be working on the next reference solution to stuff that product teams have on their, on their roadmap. Okay. They're not just creating a, a component, we're not just creating artifacts of what they intend to do, they're actually creating working software, hopefully something that the product people are waiting for. So think of it as a, a, a reference solution in an SDK. We then have a D team, a development team. These guys will split off. They'll be sent onto the different product teams as necessary in a common fashion. So where a product team has a platform concern, these guys know how to work the platform, right? They will embed with each of the product teams for whatever time it takes to do that work. So assuming that the platform has a backlog of stuff, we don't have enough people to staff all the product teams, so we split them off into little squads, two people, let's say that will go on to each of the product teams as necessary. And what happens when you do that, when you do it in a common fashion, is that product owners can now start to plan their backlogs and their dependencies based on the average cycle times that it takes the common platform team to do the work. The other great benefit of it is that organizations can start learning from one another how to work the architecture, how to work the solutions that the platform teams are dealing with. It, again, gives them better T-shaped. Um, and you, you, that, that work that, or not all that, <coughs> enables the organization to learn about what its platforms really are, that hairy stuff, like the big data stuff that nobody understands. They're always better off in the end for that, okay? Um, the other thing that development teams tend to do, or that I've usually worked is that while their day is spent with the different plat uh, product teams that they're working with, they will huddle together once a day to talk about problems that they're seeing. So a development team could very well be implementing something 
that perhaps the R team is going to be doing later on, but that we need right away. Since these people are platform people, they'll know how to integrate this together. Yes, we'll create some inventory waste in terms of branching and stuff, but we have to deal with it. Um, we can go wrong in a number of, of ways. The biggest is that it's a very radical departure from how organizations normally work. Okay, and politics can pay a, play, pay a big uh, price in this. You also, if you're going to do this, need to have a proper way of handling your portfolios so that the funding and the work that the platform people are going to do is going to line up with what the product needs are. And you're going to need to do this, again, in an anticipatory kind of way, right? Because the R team is always like a release ahead. All right, that makes sense? All right. Um, the results on this stuff, of course, I consider much better. The biggest result that I want to talk about is the batching result, right? We can never eliminate all that waste. Um, but because we're working and focused with product people all the time, our batching gets to the minimum that we can possibly do and, and do it in a way that's consistent with good architecture. Right. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. All right, a couple of thoughts. Just to re you know, re uh, reiterate things. Scaling is a really tough proposition for larger organizations because it's basically a very complex problem. But just throwing up your hands and saying, oh, we're going to return to the waterfall, that isn't going to make things any better. Okay, um, even if you uh, have scrub teams for, for product development, your organizational waste is going to return with a big vengeance. You normally see this in organizations that are doing a transformation. At first, the little pilots they put together are very successful. But then when they try to take on the book of business for the entire organization, it fails. Right? Remember Stacy, remember Sinfeld, um, the complexity theory is going to rule. Uh, I didn't really talk about Conway's Law. Forgot. Here's, here's the proposition. Uh, it came out of the 60s, and somebody said, oh, you know, development usually, for, usually follows the organizational structure. And the joke about it is if you have four, um, four organizations, you're going to have a four-passing pilot. Travel communication, you know, you don't want to exceed like set. Start small, not going to fix it in a quarter, right? Your organizational structure is going to emerge. That's going to take some time. Douglas Adam, so long. Thanks, Goldfish. And we can take whatever time we have inside this break and have some questions and answers, and we can discuss things. Thank you very much for your time.